This bust from the Capitoline Museums is traditionally identified as a portrait of Lucius Junius Brutus, Roman bronze sculpture, 4th to late 3th centuries BC. Series of checks and balances, and a separation of powers. The most important magistrates were the two consuls, who together exercised executive authority such as imperium, or military command. 27. The consuls had to work with the Senate, which was initially an advisory council of the ranking nobility, or patricians, but grew in size and power. 28. Other magistrates of the Republic include tribunes, quaristus, aediles, praetors and censors. 29. The magistrates were originally restricted to patricians, but were later open to common people, or plebeians. 30. Republican voting assemblies included the Commissia Centuriata, Centuriate Assembly, which voted on matters of war and peace and elected men to the most important offices, and the Commissia Attributa, Tribal Assembly, which elected less important offices. 31. Italy in 400 BC. In the 4th century BC, Rome had come under attack by the Gauls who now extended their power in the Italian peninsula beyond the Po Valley and through Etruria. On the 16th of July 390 BC, a Gallic army under the leadership of tribal chieftain Brennus, met the Romans on the banks of the Alia River 10 miles north of Rome. Brennus defeated the Romans, and the Gauls marched to Rome. Most Romans had fled the city, but some barricaded themselves upon the Capitoline Hill for a last stand. The Gauls looted and burned the city, then laid siege to the Capitoline Hill. The siege lasted seven months. The Gauls then agreed to give the Romans peace in exchange for 1,000 pounds of gold. 32. According to late Algent, the Romans supervising the weighing noticed that the Gauls were using false scales. The Romans then took up arms and defeated the Gauls. Their victorious general Camillus remarked with iron, not with gold, Rome by your freedom. 33. The Romans gradually subdued the other peoples on the Italian peninsula, including the Etruscans. 34. The last threat of Roman hegemony in Italy came when Tarentum, a major Greek colony, enlisted the aid of Pyrrhus of Epirus in 281 BC. But this effort failed as well. 35, 34. The Romans secured their conquests by founding Roman colonies in strategic areas, thereby establishing stable control over the region of Italy they had conquered. 34. Punic Wars. In the 3rd century BC, Rome faced a new and formidable opponent, Carthage. Carthage was a rich, flourishing Phoenician city-state that intended to dominate the Mediterranean area. The two cities were allies in the times of Pyrrhus, who was a menace to both, but with Rome's hegemony in mainland Italy and the Carthaginian Thalassocracy, these cities became the two major powers in the western Mediterranean and their contention over the Mediterranean led to conflict. 37, 38. The First Punic War began in 264 BC, when the city of Messina asked for Carthage's help in their conflicts with Hiero II of Syracuse. After the Carthaginian intercession, Messina asked Rome to expel the Carthaginians. Rome entered this war because Syracuse and Messina were too close to the newly conquered Greek cities of southern Italy and Carthage was now able to make an offensive through Roman territory. Along with this, Rome cold extended its domain over Sicily. 39. Rome and Carthage possession changes during the Punic Wars Carthaginian possessions Roman possessions The Roman siege of the Celtiberian stronghold of Numantia in present north central Spain by Scipio Emilianus in 133 BC. 36. Although the Romans had experience in land battles defeating this new enemy required naval battles. Carthage was a maritime power and the Roman lack of ships and naval experience made the path to the victory a long and difficult one for the Roman Republic. Despite this, after more than 20 years of war, 
Rome defeated Carthage and APS Treaty was signed. Among the reasons for the Second Punic War, 40, was the subsequent war reparations Carthage acquiesced to at the end of the First Punic War. 41. Generals on both sides of the Second Punic War were brilliant planners, on the Punic side were Hannibal and Hasdrubal, on the Roman were Marcus Claudius Marcellus Quintus Fabius Maximus Virocotius and Publius Cornelius Scipio. Rome fought this war simultaneously with the First Macedonian War. The war began with the audacious invasion of Hispania by Hannibal, son of Hamilcar Barca, a Carthaginian general who had led operations on Sicily towards the end of the First Punic War. Hannibal rapidly marched through Hispania to the Italian Alps, causing panic among Rome's Italian allies. The best way found to defeat Hannibal's purpose of causing the Italians to abandon Rome was to delay the Carthaginians with a guerrilla war of attrition, a strategy propounded by Quintus Fabius Maximus, how I'd be nicknamed Cunctator, delayer in Latin, and whose strategy would be forever after known as Fabian. Due to this, Hannibal's goal wage you achieved. He could not bring enough Italian cities to revolt against Rome and replenish his diminishing army, and he thus lacked the machines and manpower to besiege Rome. Still, Hannibal's invasion lasted over 16 years, ravaging Italy. Finally, when the Romans perceived the depletion of Hannibal's supplies, Thazent Scipio, who had defeated Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal in modern day Spain, to invade the unprotected Carthaginian hinterland and force Hannibal to return to defend Carthage itself. The result was the ending of the Second Punic War by the decisive Battle of Zamar in October 202 BC, which gave to Scipio his agnomen Africanus. At great cost, Rome had mad significant gains, the conquest of Hispania by Scipio, and of Syracuse, the last Greek realm in Sicily, by Marcellus. More than a half century after these events, Carthage was humiliated and Rome was no more concerned about the African menace. The Republic's focus now was only to the Hellenistic kingdoms of Greece and revolts in Hispania. However, Carthage, after having paid the war indemnity, felt that its commitments and submission to Rome had ceased, a vision not shared by the Roman Senate. When in 151 BC Numidia invaded Carthage, Carthage asked for Roman intercession. Ambassadors were sent to Carthage, among them was Marcus Porcius Gatto, who after seeing that Carthage could make a comeback and regain its importance, ended all his speeches no matter what the subject was, by saying, Ceterum sensio Carthaginem s delendum, furthermore, I think that Carthage must be destroyed. As Carthage fought with Numidia without Roman consent, the Third Punic War began when Rome declared war against Carthage in 149 BC. Carthage resisted well at the first strike, with the participation of all the inhabitants of city. However, Carthage could not withstand the attack of Scipio Emilianus, who entirely destroyed the city. Roman bronze bust of an unknown man traditional identified as Scipio Africanus the Elder from the Naples National Archaeological Museum, INV. Number 5634, dated to mid-1st century BC, 42, excavated from the villa of Papyri at Herculaneum by Carl Jacob Weber, 1750-65-43, and its walls enslaved and sold all the citizens and gained control of that region which became the province of Africa. Thus ended the Punic War period. All these wars resulted in Rome's first overseas conquests, Sicily, Hispania and Africa, and the rise of Rome as a significant imperial power. 44, 45, Late Republic. After defeating the Macedonian and Seleucid empires in the 2nd century BC, the Romans became the dominant people of the Mediterranean Sea. 46. The conquest of the Hellenistic kingdoms brought the Roman and Greek cultures in closer contact and the Roman elite, once rural, became a luxurious and cosmopolitan arm. 
At this time Rome was a consolidated empire in the military view and had no major enemies. Gaius Marius, a Roman general and politician who dramatically reformed the Roman military foreign dominance led to internal strife. Senatus became rich at the province's expense. Soldiers who were mostly small-scale farmers were away from home longer and could not maintain their land, and the increased reliance on foreign slaves and the growth of latifundia reduced the availability of paid work. 47. Income from war booty, mercantilism in the new provinces, and tax farming created new economic opportunities for the wealthy, forming a new class of merchants, called the equestrians. 48. The Lex Claudia forbade members of the Senate from engaging in commerce, so while the equestrian scout theoretically joined the Senate, they were as fully restricted in political power. 48, 49. The Senate squabbled perpetually repeatedly blocked important land reforms and refused to give the equestrian class a larger say in the government. Violent gangs of the urban unemployed, controlled by rival senators intimidated the electorate through violence. The situation came to a head in the late 2nd century BC under the Gracchi brothers, a pair of tribunes were tempted to pass land reform legislation that would redistribute the major patrician land holdings among the plebeians. Both brothers were killed and the Senate passed reforms reversing the Gracchi brothers' actions. 50. This led to the growing divide of the plebeian groups populace, and equestrian classes, optimates, dot Marius and Sulla. Gaius Marius, a novice homo, who started his political career with the help of the powerful Metelli family, soon become a leader of the Republic, holding the first of his seven consulships, an unprecedented number, in 107 BCBY arguing that his former patron Quintus Cecilius Metellus Numidicus was not able to defeat and capture the Numidian king Jugata. Marius then started his military reform, in his recruitment to fight Jugata, he levied the very poor, an innovation, and many landless men entered the army. This was the seed of securing loyalty of Thermae to the general in command. Lucius Cornelius Sulla was born into a poor family that used to be a patrician family. He had a good education but became poor when his father died and left none of his will. Sulla joined the theatre and found many friends there, prior to becoming a general in the Jugathine War. 51. At this time, Marius began his quarrel with Sulla. Marius, who wanted to capture Jugata, asked Bocchus, son-in-law of Jugata, to hand him over. As Marius failed, Sulla, a general of Marius at that time, in a dangerous enterprise, went himself to Bocchus and convinced Bocchus to hand Jugata over to him. This was very provocative to Marius, since many of his enemies were encouraging Sulla to oppose Marius. Despite this, Marius was selected for five consecutive consulships from 104 to 100 BC, as Rome needed a military leader to defeat the Cimbri and the Teutones, who were threatening Rome. Portrait bust formally identified as Lucius Cornelius Sulla after Marius's retirement, Rome had a brief peace, during which the Italian society, allies in Latin, requested Roman citizenship and voting rights. The reformist Marcus Livius Drusus supported their legal process but was assassinated, and the society revolted against the Romans in the social war. At one point both consuls were killed, Marius was appointed to command the army together with Lucius Julius Caesar and Sulla. 52. By the end of the social war, Marius and Sulla were the premier military men in Rome and their partisans were in conflict both sides jostling for power. In 88 BC, Sulla was elected for his first consulship and his first assignment was to defeat Mithridates VI of Pontus, whose intentions were to conquer the eastern part of the Roman territories. However, Marius's partisans managed isolation to the military command, defying Sulla and the Senate, and this caused Sulla's wrath. 
To consolidate his own power, Sulla conducted a surprising and illegal action. He marched to Rome with his legions, killing all those who showed support to Marius's cause and impaling their heads in the Roman Forum. In the following year, 87 BC, Marius, who had fled at Sulla's march, returned to Rome while Sulla was campaigning in Greece. He seized power along with the consul Lucius Cornelius Cinna and killed the other consul, Naeus Octavius achieving his seventh consulship. In an attempt to raise Sulla's anger, Marius and Cinna revenged their partisans by conducting a massacre. 52, 53, Marius died in 86 BC, due to age and poor health, just a few months after seizing power. Cinna exercised absolute power until his death in 84 BC. After returning from his eastern campaigns, Sulla had a free path to re-establish his own power. In 83 BC he made his second march in Rome and began a time of terror. Thousands of nobles, knights and senators were executed. Sulla also held two dictatorships and one more consulship. Whig began the crisis and decline of Roman Republic. 52. Caesar and the First Triumvirate. In the mid 1 ST century BC, Roman politics were restless. Political divisions in Rome split into one of two groups populous, who hoped for the support of the people, and optimates, the best, who wanted to maintain exclusive aristocratic control. Sulla overthrew all populist leaders and his constitutional reforms removed powers, such as those of the Tribune of the Plebs, that had supported populist approaches. Meanwhile, social and economic stresses continued to build. Rome had become a metropolis with a super-rich aristocracy, debt-ridden aspirants and a large proletariat often of impoverished farmers. The latter groups supported the Catilinarian conspiracy are sounding failure since the consul Marcus Tullius Cicero quickly arrested and executed the main leaders of the conspiracy. Onto this turbulent scene emerged Gaius Julius Caesar, from an aristocratic family of limited wealth. His aunt Julia was Marius' wife, 54, and Caesar identified with the populace. To achieve power, Caesar reconciled the two most powerful men in Rome, Marcus Licinius Crassus, who had financed much of his earlier career, and Crassus' rival, Naeus Pomptus Magnus, anglicized as Pompey, to whom he married his daughter. He formed them into a new informal alliance including himself, the first triumvirate, three men. This satisfied the interests of all three, Crassus, the richest man in Rome became richer and ultimately achieved high military command. Pompey exerted more influence in the Senate, and Caesar obtained the consulship and military command in Ball. 55. So long as they could agree, the three were in effect the rulers of Rome. Landing of the Romans in Kent, 55 BC, Caesar with 100 ships and tow legions made an opposed landing probably near Deal. After pressing a little way inland against fierce opposition and losing ships in a storm, he retired back across the English Channel to Gaul from weight was a reconnaissance in force. Olito returned the following year for a more serious invasion. In 54 BC, Caesar's daughter, Pompey's wife, died in childbirth unraveling one link in the alliance. In 53 BC, Crassus invaded Parthia and was killed in the Battle of Carhe. The triumvirate disintegrated at Crassus' death. Crassus had acted as a mediator between Caesar and Pompey, and without him, the two generals maneuvered against each other for power. Caesar conquered Gaul, obtained immense wealth respect in Rome and the loyalty of battle-hardened legions. He also became a clear menace to Pompey and was loathed by many optimates. Confident that Caesar could be stopped by legal means. Pompey's party tried to strip Caesar of his legions, a prelude to Caesar's trial impoverishment, and exile. To avoid this fate, Caesar crossed the Rubicon River and invaded Rome in 49 BC. Pompey and his party fled from Italy, pursued by Caesar. 
The Battle of Pharsalus was a brilliant victory for Caesar and in this and other campaigns, he destroyed all of the Optimates' leaders, Metellus Scipio Cato the Younger, and Pompey's son, Naeus Pompeius.